Visa, CTK from the Canadian projects. Um, uh, today's session relates to terms and conditions. Um, first, I'd like to thank um, Michael, who's our video recorder this day. Um, feel free to tweet during the session uh, with the hashtag Wikimania2014. Um, you can also download the event right uh, app to uh, keep an eye on session changes and so on. Um, just a friendly note that we do have an in and out policy, which means you can free to exit into the room whenever you like. I'm not going to shout to you to do that. I'll just do it quietly. Um, okay, so we've got three great presentations coming up for you today. Uh, the first is the Wikimedia Foundation's free software advocacy group and how you can help, which will be presented by Craig. Uh, the second presentation will be about open source homogy, getting the detail right uh, by Lily and, and Stephen. And finally, to round things up, which will take us all the way to lunch, is Creative Commons 4.0, everything you want to know and probably more, uh, by Lily and Kat. And okay, so I'll now hand you over to Greg. Made about how you work with your, your team. 
Um, and that's all well and good, right? Like it, it's not about a, again, it's not a, a critique of any kind of change. Um, but when there is a high level of turnover, you need to be aware of these things um, as an employee. Um, so just for context about Wikimedia, and this is again, not a critique, but there's I love, which is great, I, I, and as a footnote, I see no negative uh, things on the horizon, the long free software from Lila. Um, and there, but there's also new DPE, there's new reward stuff, so there's just gonna be a lot of changes that's gonna be happening, so things will change, um, and that's fine. So this is just to be aware of that. Um, so with that preface, uh, FSAG, what is the FSAG, right? The Software Advocacy Group. Um, where did it come from? Where did we get the idea to start this thing? Um, it basically came from the guy in business, right? This is one of the documents that Sue created, I guess, a year and a half ago, two years ago, or something like that. Um, year and a half. Ago. Year and a half. It's on Meta. Um, uh, you can go take a look at it. The, the first one there on the list, and this is not because it's the most important, there are things like access to knowledge on there, right? That are lower down the list. So it's not a ordered list. Um, it's a numbered list, not an ordered list. Um, it's freedom and open source. And in there, Obviously, that comes from our history of free culture and free software, very ingrained in who we are. Um, so the obvious things about that, right? Um, all the code that we write as an organization is free software, open source. Um, all content that we post, modules, very good stuff, let's not talk about that, um, is free culture. Um, and by definition, thus, we're pretty much portable. Um, and to an extreme, in a lot of ways, too. Like, some would not necessarily take it to mean that all of our config server configuration is out there in public, but it is, right? All of, and pretty much everything that you would need to run Wikipedia and sister sites is there available in a Git repo, except for passwords, but you can make new ones. Um, so, right, it's, it's, it's pretty intense how we do it that way, right? Um, the things that aren't always obvious that, that come along with this is the organizational use of software, uh, where we use software to collaborate and do things together and, and get work done, right? Um, so one of the quotes from the, the guiding principles is, you know, we strive to use open source tools over proprietary ones. Now this is deliberately um, open, right? Like we strive, right? It, it's there because we, we do want to use open source tools, but it's realizing the reality that there aren't always effective software tools available that everyone can use. Um, but it does go to say that we are continually trying to improve. Um, here's the bigger quote, don't read it, don't strain your eyes. Um, but basically this is the, the preamble to the free software advocacy group on the, it's on Office Wiki, sorry, it's a private wiki. It's just where we collaborate on things like this. So, but there's something private there, so I can copy it and show you, it's whatever. Um, but the free software advocacy group, WMF, right, is, is there to evaluate non free software use um, and determine if there are options and what they are for replacing that, um, and then present those options to the teams using it um, so that we can make some small steps towards you know, aligning ourselves more closely with the guiding principles, right? If you don't do not analyze, you can't improve, basically. Uh, so, what exactly does the FSET do? Well, some context and expectation setting here. I like context and expectations. Um, so, FSAG does not deal with running the website. We're not about telling operations what to do. Um, I mean, they do everything pretty much intensely through software anyways, so it's not about that in many respects. It's about internal software use, right? Um, does it mean 100% all the time for everyone, everywhere, everything? No, right? Like, that's just not realistic. Um, that's the world we live in, right? Um, but it does mean, as I said, continuous improvement. It is about analyzing where we are, where we want to go, and, and always making the small steps that we can make. Um, so what's in scope, right? Um, and what's out of scope? In scope is things like our use of video conferencing or spreadsheets or uh, uh, financial software or HR software. That kind of stuff is in the value way. Um, of, of this group. Uh, things that are out of scope are things that would be 
new software, new tooling that we don't yet use. So I'm not going to go along and say, or the group is going to come out and say, hey, there's this cool new to tool that does something you haven't done before. You should use it, right? Like, if this is a user interface that you don't use, then don't worry about it, right? It's not about pushing free software. It's about helping to analyze the use of software. Um, but also out of scope, as I said, was production. Um, but production is pretty darn free. Um, this is my informal list of proprietary bits of the Dubbing Web um, production environments. I said informal just because I didn't do like a actual you know, code analysis and scan of all the software, but this is pretty accurate, I think. It's, it's, if you put it to a big category of firmware as number one, you know, computer server firmware and router firmware and that kind of stuff, that's one thing. Um, there's an up net app on the production environment that we're actually getting rid of. It's going away soon. Um, and if you don't know what a NetApp is, it's just a proprietary NFS type server. So something that we can do ourselves. Um, and then the one I have crossed out there is old Anibot rules. Um, if you don't know what Anibot, Anibot is, it's basically a spam bot. But um, some of the rules were not proprietary necessarily, but hidden, not shared, right? But we don't use that anymore. To the best of my knowledge, um, I was checking with Reedy a couple days ago, and then um, I don't think I'm. Oh, sorry, MaxMind, right? MaxMind is a GeoIP database. Basically, it's what you think it is. It's given an IP. Where is this IP from? There's no real good open alternative to that that is effective. Um, so we buy the bullet and, and buy a subscription to that. Um, but that's it. That's and it, I don't. Do you know of anything? Yeah, that's it. Like this is this is. If you wanted to fork Wikipedia, these are the things you would have, well, one thing you would have to buy. The rest comes with it, right? Firmware comes with the servers. But, um, so that's it, right? Like that's, that's it, <laughs> which is pretty intense. And that's better than probably everyone other than the Free Software Foundation, is my guess. Um, so right, everything is under another side approved license. Um, so back to other things that might be in the value book is, is development and interaction. Uh, and what I mean by this is WMF engineering and community engineering development, software development, and then the interaction between engineers and the community and, and users and uh, volunteer engineers and, and everyone, right? Like that, what to say, community of engineers. Um, the tooling that supports that is, um, you know, we can say like the official resources are these. Um, yeah, Bugzilla, Bug Tracking, right? The Carrot, the Code Review, MediaWiki, of course, for <laughs> everything else. Um, and then proprietary bits that we do use, uh, internally at least, are Trello and Meagle. Um, who here has heard of Trello and or Meagle? A sorry-ish um, that you know of it. Um, it's basically, if you know what agile development is. They're tools that help you do agile development, right? You can have sprints, you can have um, backlog and all that kind of stuff. It, it's it's they're useful tools for the teams that use them, um, and they and it's not a situation where we say that they cannot use them. We, and we have Bugzilla. What do you need anything else for, right? <laughs> no offense to Bugzilla, but it's old and crappy. Um, uh, there are a few asterisks up here, as you might see, um, and what that means is all those will be going away. So. Pretty much everything other than MediaWiki for doing software development at the, at the foundation and with community contributions will be going away and migrating to the all seen eye of Fabricator. Um, if you don't know what Fabricator is, you can look it up as P H A B R C, whatever, Fabricator. I think Fabricator, but with P H, because um, it's cool like that. But it's it will be the place where all code contributions and tasks and it will replace all of those things, right? It has built-in sprints um, and agile functionality. So basically, that side of things is also improving. Um, we, it, it, it unimproved, it got a little worse for a while, I guess, if, if you only look at things along the free software angle. Um, when we did the, the addition of Trello and Mingle for, for agile development, but those were necessary um, to get work done for us. Um, so we, but we will be improving that and, and not losing too much functionality there. And in a way, it makes it a lot better for everyone because I don't know how many of you try to contribute um, software-wise with the foundation and, and the projects, but you want to be able to use your MediaWiki or, or uh, uh, Wiki account name, right, to contribute.
distribute, you don't want to have to create an account on the third party service hosted by someone else under different terms of use. Um, so Fabricator will alleviate that problem, whereas Trello and Mingle are hosted by, I forget to make Trello, and Mingle is by Cloudworks, right? It's their third party services. Um, but what about all the things that aren't you know, software development? Um, so there's a good post that I saw uh, by here from Mozilla. Um, and if you, you know historical stuff about Gerber for the last uh, number of years, you can forget his political leanings, but right here he has a pretty good um, uh, post about spending it twice, right? Uh, Mozilla is transitioning away from a more free software email solution to a less free software email solution. And I don't know who they're switching to, he didn't say, it doesn't really matter, I can make my guess, because you can probably guess yourself. Probably right is my assumption, if you guess email, but I have no idea, it might be someone else. Um, but his point of, of this post was to, to point out the fact that as an organization that has a mission, right, um, it's of an open web, you know, from Mozilla, uh, succinctly, you want to, when you spend money for software or services, you have the choice about who you can spend money with. Um, there are competing services out there most times. Um, and if there is a choice that's out there that is better than another along the lines of what that organization's mission is, um, you might as well give the money that you're gonna spend to the better mission aligned organization if there's any overlap. Um, and the argument is, well, you can read it, you don't really need to read it, it's basically succinct there, but the kicker is, you know, even if it is more expensive to go with an organization that has slightly, that, that has better aligned value in, in what they do, it probably is better for your, your mission long term to spend it there. So it, as he said it and more succinctly, it may give us a better value for money, even if it's a little more expensive, right, to deal with organizations that are more closely aligned with us. And I think that's something that, that we need to take a little more into account. Um, when, when we look at the services that we pay for, um, because I, I think it's really, the, the spending it twice is really a good way to think about it, right? It's, it's when they, when you give them money, they will be spending money on their internal development and their needs that will be aligned to their mission. So if their mission isn't aligned with yours, what, what choice are you making there? Um, so from there, really, I want most of the session to be about helping, right? That was the, the title of this presentation, is FSEG and how you can help. Um, so there's the big long list of things that you can guess that we use that are not free software to get work done. Um, how can we do better, right? So with that, I want to kind of open it up for discussions about that. Um, are any of you experienced with this issue in your own organization? Do you make choices? Do you things that are not the, the, the default mold that all organizations do. Uh, for communication, the foundation generally uses Skype. Uh, any plans to post some of that is capitalized? So the question was communication. The, uh, the foundation currently uses Skype. As, as you experience, um, there are plans to change that. I've actually seen we use Google Hangouts more, which whenever six one way, half dozen the other, right? Um, so ideally, yes. Uh, some teams have uh, toyed with other non-video conferencing um, solutions like Mumble or uh, other just audio only ones. The kicker for us that we found, so we've, there's actually a wiki page, I'm gonna see if I can break things and if my internet works, cool. Um, where is it? Uh, so, video conferencing, right? So this is the three main things that we look into as like, the group and the internet's not gonna work, but whatever. So basically, we looked at a list of about, shoot, 10 or 12 or 15 solutions to do video conferencing. Uh, Matanya, one of the volunteers that volunteered for Ops a lot, uh, set up I mean, six of them as labs and systems of open source free software video conferencing solutions. They all suck. Just blindly. Like, and I am the first person to <laughs> um, give the benefit of the doubt to free software. And they all, oops, sorry, I lost that. Um, they all suck. 
And, and really the, clip, the, the clincher for a lot of them is bandwidth. Um, so what Google is good at in this situation is being able to take your video and your audio and multiplexing it out to everyone else in the call, right? Um, a lot of the like new WebRTC solutions uh, are all P2P, peer-to-peer. -peer. So for every person that joins the call, you must multiply your video and audio and send it to everyone. So there's four people, you're sending your video four times, which is wasteful and dumb. Um, great, P, et cetera, you can do encryption that way really effectively, blah, 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 blah. but it doesn't work for teams of like 16 people for us that do this small scale. <coughs> right? We've actually already hit the limit for Google Hangouts. Um, Google Hangouts can only handle so much themselves. They, I think it's 16 or 17. Um, so any team that's bigger than that, and it doesn't, doesn't work if it's something you join. Um, so yeah, um, suggestions are very much welcome in that way. Um, and that, I think, is the one we spend the most time trying to solve, because it seems like the obvious solution that techies can solve, right? Um, but it's not. <laughs> Does anyone use free software solutions for their communication in organizations that they work at? What do you use? I just use Java. Jabber. Do you use audio, like the, the Jitsi or anything like that? Yeah, it's not sufficient. Yeah. Uh, yeah. There's a series of web RPC solutions that aren't limited, like Hangouts. Uh, so I use, I use Chatboard, Chatb.org. Yeah. Um, but uh, if people have enough bandwidth, it'll scale, it'll scale to as much bandwidth as you have. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> yep. And unfortunately, we have free volumes, and not everyone has the best connections all the time. Maybe we should just pay for everyone's home internet connection. I don't know if we did it. <laughs> Fiber to the home. Right. For all employees. For all employees everywhere. <laughs> hey, Rob. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. So as you can see, this page isn't loading anyways. Um, other things that we looked into is documents. So Google Docs. Uh, I'm going to make fun of them, but legal is probably the, the biggest user of Google Docs. Um, just because the, the free software solutions aren't necessarily the best privacy and formatting wise. Um, ironically, privacy, right? Um, and collaboration wise. And, well, yeah, right, Wikis, collaboration. Um, yeah. For, for real time, we, we do a lot of real time collaboration in the legal team, and, and yeah. the Wikis aren't there for it. Yeah, exactly. And Etherpad won't work because there's no formatting, effectively, and, and it's all public. Um, so that's a real need as well. Um, there are solutions out there, but we haven't, they're, they're big honkin solutions, right? They're big, you know, group where type solutions usually. The comments about that. Still grab that JS? Oh, uh, yeah, we're, so we're actually looking at that for media wiki. <laughs> um, together JS and, and what's the other, there's an implementation of that, I think. It is essentially about together JS. Yeah, so they're, we're working on that for media wiki. See how that turns out. So could, if we could, could find people, that, could you tell people what that is? What it is? What together JS? Oh, to, sorry. Right, together JS. It kind of sounds like what it is. It is kind of what it sounds like. Um, it's real-time collaboration among multiple people through your browser. Um, so enabling you to see the same thing and type on the same thing um, using JavaScript. So it is communicating to the back end for you. You don't have to continue to reload. Yeah. So and, and so the main idea is you can use it when editing. The yeah. wiki page. So if you enable it when you edit the wiki page, you can have multiple people in real time editing the wiki page. So it becomes like Google Docs over the wiki. And so it could be used. Yeah. And serious software. So. Exactly. Yeah. And we're, we're looking in that. Um, actually, there are a guy who um, co founded this uh, group that said uh, Mark Holmquist. He, uh, he's been doing a little bit of research into that as well. Um, so Pair that with visual editor, and we might have some <laughs> ish. <laughs> ODF. What about that? Um, so we support we. So of all organizations that I've worked with, even the mission aligned ones, um, they're we're the best at supporting ODF from our employees. Like HR will open an ODF file from you, uh, which is more than I can say for other organizations I've worked for. They know what it does, right? They know that it's actually a document. Um, but it's not the primary. Not everyone's using LibreOffice. Um, 
or if you're using the grid office, is to open the ODF for your. All right, that doesn't make sense. It's expensive than ODF. <laughs> <laughs> so I think there are very few Microsoft Office licenses. Oh really? Yeah, I think. So it's finance. Yeah. I think yeah. even finance. <laughs> well, yeah, finance might have Excel licenses. Yeah. I think we're the only ones who use Word. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. We there used to be a wiki page that kept a list of all the MS Microsoft licenses that we had, but it's woefully out of date, of course. But um, it wasn't very many. <laughs> yes. What about the file sharing? File sharing. Um, the wiki. We use stuff. stuff. Everyone needs to share some kind of binary somewhere. Um, we do have, so we're pretty good in that as well. Uh, we do have a shared NFS server that we run in house um, that, that is used by uh, your, the non engineering departments to file share stuff. Um, mailing list also gets the images, of course, of new babies and all that kind of stuff. Um, but yeah, we don't really have a, like, I don't think that's actually a thing. We, we, are, we do pretty well there. Yeah. Just like to just put a vote for Bitsync if anybody's seen that awesome service. Bitsync, it's a, uh, oh, right. Yeah, yeah, the BitTorrent one. Yeah. yeah. Go ahead. Oh, sure. So, um, I guess kind of like pulled aside, um, maybe we could talk a little bit about, um, so about like, so there seems to be a conversation between free software and open source software in the last few years. And
So uh, the question here uh, that I want to start with actually is, if, are we unhealthy, right? Is, are the Wikimedia uh, projects, uh, you know, one way to think about this is, do we hold our code projects to the same standard that we hold our on wiki content to, right? That is uh, one way that we can think about this question. And I think the answer to that is, well, we don't really know for certain, uh, but <laughs> here's a graph of the licensing information on, uh, we, we downloaded MediaWiki Core last night, we ran a scanner on it. Uh, you'll see a lot of uh, none, and you see a lot of unknown, right? Um, uh, the good news is, uh, as Stephen will discuss later, it's not uh, it's not as bad as we feared, um, but it's but it's not great, right? Uh, so so the so the conditions are not great to start with, right? What about our practices? Um, so how many of you think that you comply with Creative Commons licenses all the time? All the time. All the time. My modulo fair use, right? Modulo what? Fair use is part of the Creative Commons licenses, my friend. You don't need. Uh, <laughs> um, yeah. All right. So, is that a question or? Yeah, it's, it's, I, I think I, I feel confident that within the last six months, I did not violate the CC license. So, all right. So we have one person who. <laughs> <laughs> uh, same page now, but that, that's that's a little sad. Stick around for our next talk, Creative Commons Four. Um, so here's a really common thing uh, that programmers do, actually. They think that they're complying with licenses all the time. Stack Overflow uh, is Creative Commons. How many of you are programmers who have used code from Stack Overflow in the past year or two? Yeah, I see a fair number of hands going up. How many of you then copy that code into, well, I saw a Mozilla hand going up, so did you, uh, <laughs> did you copy that into a Mozilla public license file? Um, but a, a, a really common, uh, uh, you know, really common thing is you take this Creative Commons license snippets that you think, oh, they're just snippets of code on the web, it's all good, and then you copy it into a GPL license file, right? Now, you may not think of that as a violation. On the grand scale of license violations, it's really not all that significant, right? But it is very common. Um, I used to do, in, in a prior life, I used to do code scans, right? I used to work at a large law firm, and one of the things that we were paid to do was to look at other people's source code, right? A big company would buy a small company, and before they acquire the small company, they'd run a code scan, right? They, they, they'd take a look at their code and see, does this thing have licensing violations? Here's the thing, every single one of those that we ever ran had licensing violations in it, right? Some of them were smaller, some of them were of the, we copied three lines of Creative Commons license code from Stack Overflow into GPL. Some of them were much more significant, right? And uh, so we're gonna talk today about what are some of the practices we can do to make those kinds of things uh, go more smoothly. Um, problems that we can find in scans include uh, missing license information. Simply, this is a lovely piece of code that I literally could not find copyright information about, right? I, try, I wanted to give proper attribution in the slide deck and I couldn't find the copyright information because it lacked uh, it lacked license information in the file. Uh, and that really is a piece of code that compiles, uh, not just a Tetris graphic. Um, there's compatibility problems. So for example, uh, if you're using a GPL uh, in your code and you have some file that is GPL v2 only, you're violating the license on the GPL v2 only code, right? That's something that happens, again, all the time. People don't really think about it. And because they don't know what's in their code, they make those mistakes. Failure of attribution. The biggest single reason that people want to run code scans in commercial businesses is because they actually want to do the right thing by attributing all the authors uh, when they're shipping an Android app that has open code or uh, when they're shipping an Android phone, right? They actually want to give all the right attributions. Uh, and a lot of times it's just impossible to do right. So does this matter? Um, historically, for Wikimedia, this doesn't actually matter all that much. Uh, Wikimedia has distributed its, its code as a service, right? We've distributed as a web service. And so a lot of the open source licensing conditions don't actually apply, right? They're actually pretty much impossible to violate when you're distributing the code as a web service. We also historically have not used all that much third party code. Um, however, it's gonna matter more in the future. We're distributing more of our ops code 
thanks to the hard work of, of Greg in particular, but also his entire team uh, and, and also Rob uh, and, his, and the folks who work for him, we're doing a lot more code that we're distributing as Debian repositories, right? That is totally the right thing for us as an organization, but it does mean for the first time we've got to make sure we're actually meeting our licensed obligations for that code, right? Because it's not just living on our servers, it's going out to the world. We're shipping more apps, right? That means, again, we're shipping more binary code. We have to comply with those licenses. Um, my observation is that we're using more third-party code. And we're seeing more requests about AGPL, uh, which is going to uh, increase our obligations uh, for compliance if we want to go that route. Uh, it also matters, those are all things that matter to us, right? Are we compliant? It also matters that our code is hostile to sharing as it currently stands, right? That graph that I showed you with that, you know, two thirds of it being, uh, you know, lacking license information means that other people downstream of us, if they want to reuse our code, it's really hard for them to figure out what's going on, right? It's hard for them to comply. So it's not just about doing the right thing for us, it's that we as an organization claim that we care about sharing, and, uh, and yet we're producing all this code that's sort of possible for sharing, right? Uh, the costs I want to add here are not hypothetical. This is my old office building, it's super swank. Uh, and uh, it's where the two highest profile open source lawyers in Silicon Valley work. They get paid literally millions of dollars a year to do these kinds of code scans and check them and make sure that people aren't, doing, aren't, aren't having license violations, right? Black Duck, which is the single biggest code scanning company, they have $40 million in revenue a year, right? And that's all because people are worried about these, these license violations, right? Now, partially that's because, partially that's always going to be unavoidable because people are always going to, you know, not always play by the rules, right? So there's always going to be some cost there. But a lot of that cost, in my experience, was avoidable if the upstream projects had done a better job of, of hygiene, right? Um, so the question is to us, how can we help save some of that money? How can we take money from Black Duck and give it to uh, other organizations that are more worthy by helping get our licensing in? So with that, uh, we'll talk about the medicine and, and what we might do to improve the situation. So uh, I think to return to this idea of how do we get healthy, let's return to the, the idea that we're working with here today. Uh, we're looking for conditions and practices to maintain license health. So, so what exactly are those conditions? How do we get to a healthy open source licensing uh, regime? And as Lewis mentioned, our goal is sort of an upstream project as media wiki developers or other open source project developers should be to emit good code, right? We should be sending out code that helps our downstreams uh, comply. So how do we how do we get there? What do, what do we need to do? So the first step is to understand the state of the problem. As we just went through, uh, we had this graph, which was sort of a very quick uh, a very quick scan. This was a, like a three-minute investigation, um, something that could probably be flushed out in more detail if you were to, to apply sort of better tools here. And, and what does this tell us? Well, first, it tells us that uh, you know we have a big unknown, uh, but it also tells us that if we look at that other category, that the, 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 there's some good news. Um, we do actually have a, a good portion that is properly licensed in the GPL. We have also uh, some smaller problems. There's some uh, some, some LGPL2 that's not uh, 2 plus. Uh, there's some Apache code in there. And this is a, this is a relatively small um, other category. And it also helps us identify where those known and unknown code pieces are coming from. If you actually look at the CSV file, you'll notice a lot of the internationalization JSON files are, are missing licensing information. And when we know where the where these files what files are actually missing licensing information, we can try and figure out where that's coming from, and we can try and build practices around those files in particular. Uh, the international, internationalization files all come through a, a similar system. So a first step here is to define a standard licensing header. Um, the licensing uh, information is uh, the, the piece of the software, the, the comment right at the beginning of the code that tells you uh, the licensing information so the Software Freedom Law Center provides sort of a recommended guide on how to provide uh, licensing information. Uh, the way the way it works is, uh, yeah, there's, there's sort of a, a standard uh, block of text that you can put on the top of each file that allows you to to offer one common license for an entire project, uh, as opposed to doing like file scope licensing that just has a, a block of 
And this has a few, a few advantages. If you look, it has a, a URL for our, uh, our Git repository online. So if someone finds this file, they can look up where it came from and then see the licensing information. It also tells people uh, that this file is part of a larger project. So if this code was then removed from MediaWiki and used somewhere else, they can at least track down where it came from, rather than you know, if it's unlabeled or if it has a license header that doesn't tell you about the bigger file. It also lets you save space by referring to a common credits file. Uh, that is also available in our Git repository, so you don't have to list the authors and update them with new commits every single time. So that's new code. Just one credit. So the second step is actually to use this header. Um, there are tools to help make that happen. Uh, you can use a you know popular IDEs can help you add this in automatically and keep it hidden so you don't have to look at it all the time. Uh, there are easy ways uh, for some definitions of easy, I guess. Emacs person, which I'm not. Um, and there are other practices that you can use to help uh, do what we want to do here, which is uh, not only help our downstream users, but help get our own house on. Um, and that's something I'm really going to talk about. And you know, I want to note here that, um, of course, we are the foundation's lawyers, but I think our theme here is that this is something that we need to think about as a community, right? Um, Stephen and I could impose the, these kinds of solutions top down, um, but part of why we're presenting this here is to sort of get the ideas out there so that people can figure out what exactly is going to work best with the nature of our solutions and the nature of our processes. We've both done a lot of open source over the years, so I think, I hope that the kinds of things we're, we're talking about here are actually pretty well uh, already come with a certain amount of optimization for what we do, but uh, you know, it'll, of course, when the rubber beats the road, it can be different. So, so some practices that we could consider adding to our workflows at, uh, in media um, We could be doing more to check the, to ensure that we're publishing good binaries, right? My understanding is that the engineering team runs Debian Lint on their, uh, okay, Greg's making, okay, that was the, so Greg tells me we're running Debian Lint, which does some licensing checking on our Debian packages. There's no real equivalent, no real equivalent of that for Android or iOS yet, um, but that's something we could consider adding to the workflow before we ship uh, before we ship new binaries, right? Um, we could be doing scan. Ah, okay, so it is working. Uh, I've never used an MVN yet. A slide deck before. I'm sort of excited. Um, the <laughs> Uh, we could be doing scans at commit time, right? So Stephen and I uh, pulled, there's a, an open source tool called Ninka, which was used to generate the, uh, the graphs we showed you earlier. We could be doing uh, scans like Ninka at commit time, right? As part of the Garrett or soon to be fabricator workflow, we could be, uh, you know, minus oneing uh, files that, uh, that are lacking proper headers that lack license information or that have conflicting license information. Uh, somebody would have to, to write that tooling, uh, 